Okay, so, uh, and I do have that quote written out here because I was going to ask you about it. Don't be a weed. <laughs> Don't ever even be a prize petunia. <laughs> As you say, it's a garden of possibilities in the book. What should we really be? I mean, if we take it out of the garden and we look at this country that we've got, and we look at other, it, whatever country we're living in, and we've got these people fighting for power yeah. and control, oh, yeah. what yeah. can we do in our little garden to be, you know, to make a difference? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. And by the way, you're mentioning that this applies to every country. One of my favorite fan letters about the book is from a 19 year old young man in Bucharest, Romania, who said, I just read your book, The Everyday Patriot. It makes me want to be a better Romanian right away. And I said, that's what I was looking for. That's that's what I was after. And, and it's funny because you know, George Washington was worried about there being political parties right. because he was worried that people would affiliate mm -hmm. with the party more than they did the nation. And he was um, right then, too. I mean, if you take a yeah. look at it, I mean, yeah. people have a tribe that they want to belong to. And that's, that's right. Because your right. tribe and the other tribe is not good. I know. And and they think they're making their tribe stronger right. by being adversarial, by being critical of other tribes. But when you understand the philosophy behind human flourishing, you understand that when you cut your tribe off from another tribe, you don't make it stronger, you make it weaker. Um, and your question about how, how we get beyond this adversarial mindset is such a great question. So I was reading, um, when I turned 50, about 55, um, long, long ago, <laughs> uh, I realized I had not read a lot of great world literature. I was a philosopher focused on reading philosophy, but other stuff like great novels, great poetry, I didn't read that kind of stuff. I, I had never been interested, but I had seen a bunch of magazine articles where great writers, living writers were asked, what's the greatest novel ever written? And a bunch of them said Don Quixote. And maybe that was universal. They all said it. Really? So a new, yeah, a new, a new translation had just come out, 900 and some pages. Yeah. A reason I had never read it. Uh, but I, went <laughs> I think I it. have that translation. <laughs> <laughs> I went and bought it and I read it and I said to my wife, okay, I haven't read many novels, so I'm not in a position to know these guys were right, that this is the greatest novel ever written, but I get it. I see why they said that. And so then I said, then I read Moby Dick and then I read and I kept reading, kept reading. Well, the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, from ancient Greece, I had been force fed in school, you know, like everybody, a little bit of each. But I went back, I think it was three years ago during the pandemic, I re went back in one year, I read reread the Odyssey four times through cover to cover. It's almost as big as, as Don Quixote. And I reread the Iliad twice. So between the Iliad and the Odyssey, that's six readings. And I finally understood those two books for the first time in my life, having heard about the Iliad and the Odyssey, even having read them in school, I didn't understand them. Okay, so what did you learn from, I mean, how does that apply to today? What went boom for you? Two big things. Uh, the Odyssey is Odysseus trying to get home after the Trojan War. He's he's fought the Trojan War for 10 years. He's trying to get home. That takes another 10 years. He fight. He's up against every uh, obstacle, adversity imaginable, and he somehow gets through them all because of one thing, his strong sense of purpose. The Odyssey is about the power of purpose in difficult times. Wow. The Iliad the, is about the battle that he was fighting at, at Troy, right, before he tries to get back home. Mm -hmm. And and the Iliad is about the power of partnership, partnership and purpose. So the Iliad opens, the leader of the Greeks, Agamemnon, and the greatest warrior, Achilles, mm -hmm. they're supposed to be partnering together to uh, defeat Troy. And rather than that, they get at each other's throats. They, in a sense, have their own tribes, their own egoistic right, concerns. Right. I, I want more. You've got more than I have. I want more. I deserve more, Agamemnon says. No, I do, Achilles said. They start fighting each other, and then things start going badly. But partnership is portrayed in a powerful, positive way in, a, in all throughout the book. Now, the most surprising, and this gets to the answer to your original question, which, by the way, as a philosopher, I can seem like I long ago forgot your yeah. question, but I, I'm getting to that it. Way and you're I'm getting back to it. to it, I know. My favorite passage in the Iliad is in what they call Book 6, on the plain outside Troy, where there are battles being fought here and there, all across the horizon. 
two warriors come up against each other, one Trojan and one Greek, and their job is one of them has to kill the other one. And the Greeks, I think it's the Greek who says to the Trojan, he said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Before we get into this, I got to ask you, I've seen you today. You're amazing. I've never seen anybody fight the way you do. You're, pro you're probably going to kill me. I mean, you're, you fight, you're like a god or something. I got to know who you are. Would you please tell me who you are? And, and the guy says, what are you talking about? I'm the guy who's getting ready to kill you. Yeah, yeah. Tell me your background, please. I got, I, who, who's your father? Where'd you come from? You know, what brought you here? And finally, the guy says, all right. Well, my father was so-and-so. My grandfather was so-and-so. He lived in such and such. But whoa, whoa, whoa. Your grandfather was who? He gives the name of his grandfather. And the Greek says, my grandfather and your grandfather were best friends. And he says, what? My grandfather visited your grandfather. He ho your grandfather hosted my grandfather and was wonderful. And I grew up hearing stories about your grandfather. Look, 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 we cannot fight each other. We've got too much in common. And so they decide in the middle of this raging battle to take off their heavy armor and trade armor. So their friends will think, you know, it, it, uh, the, the friends of the other guy won't attack. They'll think this guy is Diomedes and this guy is the other guy. And they all of a sudden become friends because they had discovered something they have in common. Now, I've been telling people ever since the book came out, that seems to be the secret sauce for partnerships. Discover the values you have in common. Two guys in Wilmington, North Carolina, where I live, both working in a soup kitchen, one on one end of the political spectrum, one on the other end of the political spectrum, but they never had a chance to talk politics because they're busy getting the food ready for the people who are about to show up. And they do this week after week after week, and they get to be good buddies. They're joking about basketball. They're joking about football, about baseball. They're joking about the other people working there. They're, they just get to be good buddies. And then one day politics comes up and they're really surprised that they're on opposite ends of the political spectrum. But it kind of doesn't matter because this is a good guy. Mm -hmm. They have so much in common by that point. They're able to laugh off their differences and actually start listening to each other about why they believe what they believe. And they start moving a little closer together, like those guys on the plane outside Troy.